calls to 911 can hear some of the most panicked and distressing moments of people's lives. For the most part, 911 calls tend to be mundane, though still concerning moments, such as vandalism or a robbery. But other times, 911 calls capture truly shocking and unbelievable events. What is up, Iwu crew? Today, we are taking a look at some of the most chilling 911 calls that you've likely never heard of. The three cases we have for you today are alarming and unsettling, and you can hear it all for yourself. Let's get into it. All right, this is what's happened. Um, I've been married 12 years. On, on, on the 4th, which would have been two nights ago at 4 a.m., um, I shot my wife in the temple of her head. I thought I killed her. And um, I put her in the freezer out in the garage. Well, I checked on her at night, and she's not dead. Um, she's uh, got a big hole in the temple of her head. And um, um, to get her body moved around in there, I think I broke her wrist. You know, she was frozen from being in the in the thing. She's been in the thing 48 hours now. Um, and this, this is no prank call. I need somebody to get out there and help her. At 2:45 a.m. on Friday, November 7th, 2014. A man from Springfield, Tennessee, called 911. He identified himself only as Joe and explained in a soft, calm voice that he had shot his wife in the head with a 38 caliber handgun. He said to the 911 operator, All right, this is what's happened. Um, I've been married 12 years. On, on, on the 4th, which would have been two nights ago at 4 a.m., um, I shot my wife in the temple of her head. Joe went on to make it crystal clear that this was no joke, saying, She's, uh, got a big hole in the temple of her head. And, um, um, to get her body moved around in there, I think I broke her wrist. You know, she was frozen from being in the, in the thing she'd been in the same 48 hours now. Um, and this, this is no prank call. I need somebody to get out there and help her. I've cleared, I've cleared the premises. I've got away. You know, I'm not going to be there. Um, but I, I promise you this is a legit call and I need somebody to get out there and help her because I, I, I still love her. It's, it's hard, hard to believe. That. He asked for paramedics to come to his home, along with an ambulance and maybe even a helicopter. It was later revealed that the caller was 45-year-old Joseph Parker. His wife was 44-year-old Samantha Parker. The police were quickly dispatched to the scene, but when they arrived, they weren't sure what to expect. From the 911 call, they were certain they would find Samantha with a gunshot wound and were likely preparing themselves to begin life-saving attempts. However, when they uncovered Samantha Parker's body stuffed in a freezer in the home's garage, they realized she was already dead. Given the nature of her gunshot wound to the head, it shouldn't have been surprising, but the earlier 911 call had left officers confused and surprised at the reality of the situation. Samantha was pronounced dead at the scene. Russell Gupton, the Robertson County Emergency Medical Services Assistant Director said, there was no possibility of her being alive at all. Joseph was long gone by the time the police arrived at the home to find that the scene there had been partially cleaned up. In fact, the house was described by investigators as being real estate clean without even a speck of dust. Upon further investigation of Samantha's body, it was discovered that she was partially dismembered, and it wasn't actually clear just how long she had been dead, furthering the confusion over what Joseph had said during the 911 call. You see, he had said to the 911 operator that he thought he had killed her, which was why he put her body in the freezer. 
but he told the operator that two days after shooting her, he went to check on her body around 1.30 a.m. the night that he called 911, where Joseph said that he discovered she wasn't dead. He said, quote, she's frozen solid. It's amazing she's still alive. He told the 911 operator that Samantha couldn't talk, but she could blink her eyes once for yes and twice for no. Joseph continued, saying, um, to get her body moved around in there. I think I broke her wrist. You know, she was frozen from being in the, in the thing. She's been in the thing 48 hours now. Despite being in the freezer so long and with a gaping head wound, he was certain that she was still alive. Joseph then told the 911 operator that he had been married to Samantha for 12 years and said that they never really fought or had any domestic problems, but that the couple just had a, quote, really bad night. He clarified that he loved every day that they had been married, despite what happened. Joseph insisted that even though he had shot Samantha, it was only a rough stretch. Reportedly, the night he shot Samantha was actually their 12th wedding anniversary. Joseph talked in a calm, almost a distant manner as he told the operator how he's left the house open for police to come and find Samantha. I left the front door open. I left all the lights on in the house. So it would be kind of easy to find the last house on the right on Flysdale Lane. Um, but I left the front door open and she's in the garage to go through the kitchen to get into the garage. And you'll see her once you get in the garage. The Springfield police allegedly reported that in a bizarre twist, Joseph answered his phone when dispatchers called him back around 3.45 a.m. when his wife's body was discovered, and he apparently told them directly that he was on the interstate headed to Chattanooga to visit friends. That afternoon, about 13 hours after he had made his haunting 911 call, Tennessee authorities called the Kentucky State Police to say that they were pursuing Joseph on the Interstate 65. State troopers caught up with him at the 10-mile marker, but that was when things took a dramatic turn. At about 3.45 p.m., Joseph pulled over on the shoulder of the highway just as the troopers closed in. There, he shot and killed himself near the 12-mile marker in Simpson County. The alleged self-inflicted fatal shot is currently under investigation. It isn't clear why Joseph told 911 that his wife was still alive after shooting her in the head and placing her body in the freezer for 48 hours. Did he really think she was still alive? Or was it a ruse he had come up with to try to convince police that he wasn't guilty of her death? Or perhaps it was Joseph's own wishful thinking, hoping that he could take back what he had done. We may never know the truth about what Joseph had been thinking, but what we do know is that his call to 911 was certainly chilling. The next case we have for you is even more surprising, as most of the events were actually caught on the recorded 911 call. Do you need police, fire, or EMS? Police. Police, and what's wrong? We have a, um, a trespasser. He's on our property and he won't leave. Do you know who the person is? No, but he's wearing, he's just walking around, and I think he's either drunk or something, because he's just walking around, and we asked him to leave, and is he's this, like making it. Is this person white, black, or Hispanic? White. What does he have on? He has a blue, um, he has a mustache and a blue, like, a beanie and a big, big jacket. Big jacket, what color? What color and jacket? What color what? Jacket. Um, it's like a, a black, black or navy, and he's wearing light colored jeans. I mean, he's literally just standing in our yard, like, smoking a cigarette. Alan, stop! Anyone there have a weapon? Yes, Alan does, the, the guy who owns the property. All right, can you just come inside? He's not trying to break in, is he? No. Alan, Alan, you need to go inside. This is what they're saying. Now, 
let the officer handle it, okay? Okay. Okay, so the homeowner, his name is Alan, what's his last name? Stevenson. And he's wearing, this guy's wearing, um, like a plaid. Alan! Is this a handgun? Yes. Ma'am, is this a handgun that Alan has? What did you say? Does Alan have a handgun? Um, no, I think it's a shotgun. Alan Stevenson was an entrepreneur and the founder of a clothing company that was rising in success. In fact, his company was even placed on a list collected by Forbes magazine as a one of the most promising companies in America. With all of his recent success, Alan likely had no idea the surprising turn his life would take. Alan's house was situated across 30.9 acres in Greenville County, South Carolina and was valued at around $1.35 million. House is a bit of an understatement. As it was described on oldhousedreams.com as being a castle that was built in 1902 for a German baroness. Perfect for privacy, the house is not visible from any roads and is tucked away behind 700 feet of woods. Reportedly, on March 19, 2016, at around 8.30 in the morning, Alan and his girlfriend were in their kitchen. From there, they say they saw someone walking on their driveway. Due to the remote situation of their home, they were surprised to see anyone at all. Alan says he immediately went outside to confront the man and ask him to leave his property. According to Alan, the man refused and told him that he was just going for a walk. A later report from the coroner's office stated that Alan returned back into his home to collect a shotgun before he then returned outside. Alan says that he collected the shotgun to escort the alleged intruder off his property, but once outside on his porch, he fired two warning shots. He later described the alleged intruder as hostile while this was happening, Alan's girlfriend called 911 to report that there had been a trespasser on their property. While she's on the phone, she can be heard talking to Alan and desperately asking him to come back inside. In fact, she is heard telling him to come inside the house at least five separate times. The report from the coroner's office detailed that the two men began circling each other, about six feet apart all while Alan's girlfriend called for him to come back inside. Alan, get inside right now. That's what the police is saying. Get inside. Get inside. No, come right now. The encounter quickly escalated, only ending when Alan reportedly shot the alleged intruder. Alan later said that he shot the man only after he had taken a knife out of his pants and thrust it towards him. The solicitor's office said that Alan shot at the man five times, and three of the shots struck him. The gunshots can be heard over the 911 call, and Alan's girlfriend can be heard crying and screaming in response. <laughs> Ma'am, is he shooting the man? into the home, where he then took the phone from his girlfriend and began speaking to the dispatcher. The first thing Alan says is, I just, I just killed a man, I'm sorry. Okay, what made you want to discharge your gun to hurt him? He pulled a knife out and came at me. He had his hand in his pocket and he kept getting closer and closer. He got to be about two feet away. He pulled a knife out, he came at me with it, and I shot him several times. The alleged intruder was later revealed to be 32-year-old Matthew Whitman. Matthew was from Nature Trail, Greenville, about a mile and a half from Allen's castle. 
Matthew died at the scene. The final autopsy revealed that he was shot in the face, chest, and left forearm, but it was the wound to his chest that killed him. A toxicology report also stated that he was negative for any drugs in his system at the time. When the 911 operator asked Alan if Matthew had threatened him with the knife, he replied, Yes, he did. He did. He pulled the knife out. He came at me like it with a stabbing motion from about two feet away. Okay. I was scared for my life, I can assure you. And before he did, I said, all right, fine, you can stay, you can stay. Because as he kept getting closer with his hand in his pocket saying, I'm not leaving, I'm just taking a walk. I, I realized he was threatening just by coming up close with his hand in his pocket. I didn't know if he had a gun or a knife. And then when he produced the knife, when he produced the knife and came a few feet from me with a stabbing type motion. Okay, why didn't you come into the house, sir? Why didn't you come into the house? We I was trying to come into the house and he, I was trying to come into the house and he placed himself between me and the way into the house. My girlfriend kept calling saying, come into the house. And I said, okay, I'm coming. I'm just going to stand here for a second. When asked if Matthew said anything to him, Alan replied, He said nothing. He just used, he point, he extended the knife towards me. He extended the knife towards me in a stabbing type motion from a few feet away and kept advancing at me. I, I, I can tell you for certain that I, I would have been stabbed if he continued to do what he was doing. Matthew's family argued that what had occurred seemed to be a confrontation that Mr. Stevenson aggressively initiated against the pleas of both the 911 operator and the witness. Despite Matthew's family's claims, the 13th Circuit Solicitor's Office announced that Alan Stevenson was immune from prosecution for the shooting death of Matthew Whitman. Solicitor Walt Wilkins revealed that Allen had been on his property and legally standing his ground and had no choice but to defend himself. Today's final case might be the most chilling of all. 911, do you need police? Fire or an ambulance? It's an emergency. Okay, what do you need? You need a police fire or an ambulance? I don't know, the baby's dead. What address are you calling from? A stupid what? snake got out in the middle of the night and strangled the baby. Okay. Stay on the line with me. I'm going to get you over to an EMS dispatcher. You need to answer all their questions, okay? Yeah. What is the address of your emergency? Okay, and are you in a subdivision or a mobile home park? No, I'm at the house. We're right on the road. Okay. And what's your name, please? Okay, and what's the problem? Tell me exactly what happened. The, the, our snake, we have a Burmese python, and she's about 12 foot long. She got out of the cage last night and got into the baby's crib and strangled her to death. Stay on the line, please. Can... Okay, I do have help on the way there for you, sir. I need to ask you a few more questions, okay? 21-year-old Jaron Hare and 34-year-old Charles Jason Darnell were living together in Oxford, Florida in 2009 with Jaron's two-year-old toddler, Cheyenne Hare. The family didn't live alone, however, as they also kept a rather unusual pet an eight foot, six inch albino Burmese python named Gypsy. The family appeared content, as Jaron and Charles were soon expecting their own child together. However, things quickly took a dark and surprising turn. On the morning of July 1st, 2009, Charles made a distressing 911 call. Charles is hard to understand on the 911 operator's recording as he is crying and gasping for air but it is clear when he says, It's an emergency. I don't know the baby's dead. Charles was referring to two-year-old Cheyenne. At first, it wasn't clear what had happened to Cheyenne, but then Charles stated, A stupid snake got out in the middle of the night and strangled the baby. 
On the 911 call, Charles is later heard referring to the snake, saying, I'm going to kill the... Charles told investigators that the previous night he had put the five-year-old snake into a bag before placing it in its aquarium. Gypsy was kept in a 200-gallon glass aquarium, which this snake allegedly escaped from on multiple occasions. It was reported that the aquarium had no lid, but rather was sealed with a safety-pinned quilt. In the morning when Charles looked into the aquarium, the snake was gone. He then ran into the toddler's bedroom and found the snake wrapped around Cheyenne. In a panic, he tried stabbing the snake repeatedly, reportedly with a knife and meat cleaver to get it to release the toddler before he finally was able to pry it off. The snake then went under the dresser where it was later recovered and removed. It was then held as evidence for the investigation. When paramedics arrived at 10 a.m., they declared Cheyenne was already dead. It was ruled that the toddler had been asphyxiated in her crib and that the python had tried to eat her. The deputy chief medical examiner, Wendy Lavezzi, cited her findings on the numerous bite marks she found around Cheyenne's head, face, and arms. Burmese pythons are known as an invasive species that attack their prey by constricting around their bodies until they stop breathing. They are also known to be capable of killing alligators in the wild. During the ensuing trial, it was revealed that it was Charles who had owned the python. The defense argued that Cheyenne's death was just a terrible accident. Charles's attorney made the argument that he is not guilty of manslaughter, he's not guilty of murder, he's not guilty of neglecting that child. He is guilty of making a stupid decision and having a stupid pet. The defense also described Gypsy as a gentle snake previous to the attack. Charles spoke publicly about a month after Cheyenne's death to the Orlando Sentinel, where he said that he and Jaron were still in mourning, but that the international publicity around the case has made him a monster in the eyes of many. Charles went on to explain that he had spent much of his life around reptiles, but that he would never have another snake after what happened. During the trial, a snake expert testified that it appeared Gypsy was underweight as a healthy Burmese python at her age should weigh about 150 pounds, much more than Gypsy's 13 and a half pounds. The Huffington Post reported that the python had allegedly not been fed in a month prior to the incident. The jury's foreperson spoke to the press, saying that it was the adult's duty to make sure that the toddler was safe. Because of the responsibility placed on the adult in the home to protect Cheyenne, Jaron Hare and Charles Jason Darnell were found guilty of manslaughter, third-degree murder, and child neglect. They were each sentenced to 12 years in prison. Following the jury conviction, the prosecutor stated that Cheyenne's death could have easily been avoided. This case is believed to be the first prosecution of a killing by snake in Florida. It is rare that the public has the chance to experience some of the more shocking 911 calls the operators respond to, but one thing is for certain. These three chilling 911 calls are some of the more disturbing calls they get, but cases like these are more frequent than you may think.